Hi, my name is Jake Bossenkemper, Director of Agronomy and Research here at Liquor Grow. Hi, I'm Katie Hess, Director of Sales and Marketing here at Liquor Grow. Dr. Jake, we're continuing our fall fertilizer series. Um, this last one we talked about fertilizer technology on phosphorus, where we started and where we're at today. A uh, quick shout out to the folks that think, that reminded us that we did use fish as a form of fertilizer at one point. Yeah. I wanted to make sure I got and, that in and, the video And today. guano or bat poop. We forgot that one. Too. Yes, we didn't, we we didn't go back too. far enough. Yes. Um, so now that threw me off because now today we're going to talk about phosphorus and the soil levels where it should be. But we can't even talk about that until we talk about lime. Yeah. Because they are all so Yeah, they're all, inter they're all intermingled. So yes. when you think about phosphorus fertilizer in the same thought process, you should think about soil pH. Okay. Yep. And the reason you should do that is, you know, that should be the first thing that you correct before you start thinking about making big changes and big adjustments to your phosphorus fertilization program. You need to think about soil pH. You need to get that fixed first. Okay. Or fix it at the same time. So, you know, you, you really never want your soil pH to get below about 5354. Five, you start to see corn yields go down and soybean yields go down, economically go down when you get that low. Um, and you also start to tie up phosphorus with aluminum and iron. Okay? okay. At the other end of the spectrum, when you get above 7273, you start to tie up phosphorus with calcium. Okay. Um, and there's not a lot you can do when your soil pH gets above 7273. You really can't fix that economically. You could apply a whole bunch of elemental sulfur, and over time that would lower it, but you, you can't do that economically. So there's really nothing you can do about it except for manage it. Okay. And when you have high pH soils, the thing you want to start thinking about is uh, banded applications of phosphorus, um, uh, products that can protect phosphorus, like a Vale T5, for example. And I've done quite a bit of work on a Vale T5, and it can be a very effective product. So and that's where it would shine. So there's options out there. So Liquor Go covers Wisconsin, Illinois, and Iowa. And in Iowa, from Minnesota all the way down to Missouri, is there... Um, any part of our territory that sees these high pHs, yeah, so I it's, be worried. it's definitely common to see naturally high soil pHs near our Hampton, Iowa location and our Clear Lake, Iowa location. It does happen, you know, around the Quad Cities geography and south, but it tends to be in isolated pockets. Um, but there are pockets of nat of soils that have naturally occurring high, high pH. You know, one of the old adages that I've always heard is if you've got really low pHs, um, you'll start to have problems with your weed control. Is there anything to that? Yeah, there is something to that. Those herbicides are formulated to be most effective, you know, at pHs of 5.5 five to, to 7, right? So if you get above or below that, you know, you can, you know, you can have herbicides that don't work effectively as too. I mean, you have to get pretty extreme, you know, and you shouldn't be out of those bounds anyway. But if you're having weed control problems, I wouldn't be surprised that soil pHs may be out of whack. Okay, so it's dry here in the Quad Cities and throughout most of our territory, although there are some that caught the nice rains, um, and good for you. I'm glad that you're catching those rains. Uh, is now a good time to be pulling samples for those pH for the lime, or, or should you just wait it out? Yeah, I, I think, you know, if you really think you need to make a change regarding liming, um, you know, you're going to have to decide that off a soil test. And unfortunately, right now, you're going to get lower pHs than you would normally have. I really think you need to wait for a rain or take those soil samples this spring, specifically for liming. If you think you have a soil pH problem, definitely go ahead and take those soil samples this spring to understand what the pH is and go ahead and apply lime this spring. So Dr. Jake, this is the question people have been asking me for 15 years. What phosphorus level should I have out here in the field to be most well, efficient and grow the best a, yield? That's a great question. And here's where we're going to get into kind of the, uh, there's a couple philosophies out there regarding phosphorus fertilization approaches okay there's the build and maintain approach with the build and maintain the approach the idea is you're fertilizing the soil okay and if you take that approach you know you want to have soil test phosphorus levels you know at 20 or more okay because you know that would suggest that you will never have yield limitations due to a lack of phosphorus fertilizer right so if you're below 20 part per million let's say you're at 15 part per million that means that you need to build to 20 part per million, but you also are going to have to apply above crop removal, above and beyond crop removal to build. Okay, that's one approach that's out there and widely used. Um, I think if you own your ground or you're in a very secure lease situation, 
if that's you know the way you want to approach it that's a that's a reasonable approach and one big advantage to that is it allows some flexibility you know let's say that phosphorus fertilizer prices go through the roof for some unknown global phenomena like COVID, for example, or the war in Ukraine, war. <laughs> then it gives you some flexibility because you wouldn't have to fertilize, okay? There are some disadvantages though. And the one big disadvantage is when you build your soil test levels and you maintain them at a high level, you're gonna be less efficient with your phosphorus fertilizer and over the long run, it's gonna cost you more money, okay? Because a good portion of that phosphorus is gonna end up getting fixed in the soil. Will it come back? Some of it will come back, but you're going to be dependent on Mother Nature and the soil chemistry to cycle that back through. So you don't really know when you're going to get it back or how much you're going to get back. That uh, sounds like you're going into Elite Academy there, Jake. You can check more, <laughs> more this winter. So, so the other move approach, into the next one. Yeah. The other approach is the sufficiency approach. Sufficiency, okay. starting with an S. Starting with an S. And that approach is you're feeding the so you're feeding the crop, and not the soil. Sure. Okay. So with that approach, you're more focused on timely. You're focused on phosphorus fertilizer applications that can make that phosphorus fertilizer most efficient, and maximize yield without having to spend extra money on phosphorus that you may or may not get back. Okay. And that's the approach that I personally like. However. It is best suited for folks who have short land, short, you know, uh, land uh, leases. leases. Mm -hmm. um, but that's about 65% of the ground in the state of Iowa today. So there's a good portion of ground that would fall in that category. So the scenario would go like this. Let's say that you have soil test levels of 10 part per million. Okay. It probably, no, it definitely is not economic, economical to use the build and maintain approach. Okay. Because you're a short -term lease. on a short term lease. Right. Yes, for sure. It's not economical. So now you need to start thinking about what can I do to maximize the dollars that I spend on phosphorus? That would include things like banding. That would include things because banding reduces phosphorus fertilizer tie up. That would include things like placement with a strip tail application or exact strip. Exact strip. That would include things like using phosphorus fertilizers enhancers like a VLT5. And that system in general is characterized by generally lower rates, um, generally lower rates of phosphorus, but you have to fertilize every year because if you don't fertilize, you could be at jeopardy of losing yield, right? So uh, negative to that is if you've got high fertilizer prices, you're going to have to pay them because you're, you, you, need you don't fertilize. have that build and maintain. Correct. Correct. So those are the two big philosophies out there. I really like the feed the crop or the sufficiency approach in unsecure lease situations. I even like it in the secure in the secure lease or owned land situations, but for the flexibility, some might prefer the build and maintain approach. And really, it's a business decision, it's a personal preference decision, and this is where you need to sit down with your look and go salesman and have that conversation. Great, anything else that you'd like to talk about today, Jake? Uh, I think we've probably reached our five minute time limit, so um, probably better wrap it up. So Jake, is there anything else that you'd like to talk about on phosphorus fertilization? Yes. In fact, Katie, you can't cut me off. I have one more important thing to say. Okay. So I talked about the build and maintain approach and I talked about the sufficiency approach, right? Well, universities have studied this, believe it or not. There's a couple long-term experiments out there where they've looked at corn yield and profitability using the sufficiency approach or using the build and maintain approach. And generally what those studies have concluded is you get approximately the same yield regardless of what approach you use, but you spend less money on fertilizer over time in the sufficiency approach. And I will, uh, we will, we will put links or pictures of those studies Down below. on the video. Sure. Yeah. Well, I hope everybody's having a great day and either preparing for harvest or starting into harvest. Um, we hope you have a safe harvest and join us next week on our fall fertilizer series. We're going to be talking about soil sampling in this dry weather. Sounds good. Stay in the know with Liquid Grow.